On this episode, I'm gonna talk about the perfect tracks to practice your mixing, should you bring a spare controller to a gig when you're playing, and a lot more. Let's go. For the last 22 years, I've been rocking stages, playing in clubs, and having a lot of fun as a DJ and turntablist, and I've seen and learned a lot. Now it's time for me to share that knowledge by answering the questions that can help you become a better DJ. I'm DJ TLM, and this is Share the Knowledge. Hey guys, what's going on? Welcome to episode four of Share the Knowledge. This is the show where I answer the questions that you guys can ask me. Just ask your question on Twitter and Instagram and add the hashtag share the knowledge and I'll pick as many questions as I can and throw them into these episodes. Now, I have to start this show by saying rest in peace to Fife Dog from Tribe Called Quest. Tribe Called Quest, one of my all-time favorite hip-hop groups and... Five Dog passed away a couple of days ago, so that felt pretty weird because he's not that much older than me, even though it feels like I grew up on their music. Those guys are not that much older than me. Uh, He passed away, and today we, here in the Netherlands, lost a legend, legendary um, sportsman, Johan Cruyff. Now, if you know anything about football, and yes, in the States, I know you guys like to call this soccer, but it's football. Johan Cruyff is one of the all-time greatest and an absolute legend and had a major impact on the game. Same way that Tribe Called Quest had a big impact on the hip-hop scene back in the days. And yeah, it feels weird to lose all those people that you grew up on or grew up with. So rest in peace to them. But this is in no way going to be a sad show. We're going to get into the questions. I have a lot of questions. I have way too many questions for one episode. So I want to dig into those questions right now. Wow, I actually see a new email coming in right now. I'm not going to check that one first because I have some marked already. First question I want to get into is from David again. And David was the 12-year-old producer. And by no means do I pick favorites, but he just happened to be lucky. I opened the phone, opened my email, and that was the first email I saw. And if I see a good question, bang, I throw it in there. So... David again, and I was wondering, should you always carry a spare controller? I was wondering about this because one time my controller stopped working at a house party and I couldn't DJ anymore. So please let me know, is it good to carry a spare controller? Spare equipment. Every DJ does this differently. Some DJs will actually bring double everything. So they will have a laptop and they will have a backup laptop. They have their music on an external hard drive and they bring an extra external hard drive. And then you have DJs who bring one SD card to play on CDJs. Now, I try to play safe and bring backups of all the equipment I need, the simple stuff like I have extra USB cables. I bring my own needle stylus and I have two. Sometimes I even brought four. Nowadays, mostly I bring two because they will have two at the venue and I have two of my own. So then you have backup. Uh, Vinyl, I want to make sure I have enough. So most of the times I try to bring four of my Serato control vinyl. But when it comes to like a laptop, I have one laptop. If that breaks down, I cannot continue to play with my laptop. What I will bring is a flash drive, or actually I have two, sometimes three, that were made for CDJs. So prepared in record box. And if anything happens to my equipment, and they have CDJs, I could continue to play on those. But that's as far as I'm willing to take it. But in the future, and I said this in my Akai AMX and AFX review, I would like to pack uh, an AMX in my bag because that's a really small mixer audio interface for Serato DJ. So that's a good thing to have if you're touring. I'm not bringing that to every club gig. But then again, if I have an AMX and my laptop breaks down, I still can't play. But you really have to decide what feels most comfortable for you. I do not bring extra computers, and if I play on a controller, I'm not bringing two controllers. Uh, Too much hassle, but in a perfect world, it would be great to have double everything. The next question is from Julius. Hey, TLM, in your opinion, is it a good idea to use two DJ systems at the same time? And the example is a turntable on one deck and a CDJ on the other. Now, I would not call that using two systems, but it is using different type of equipment because you will have two different players, a CDJ and a turntable. Is it a good idea? I don't know. 
it might be a little bit strange to have two different devices if you're used to playing on turntables to suddenly have to play with a turntable and a CDJ or the other way around if you're used to CDJs to playing with a CDJ and a turntable. But even if you're familiar with both devices, I would think that it would feel a little bit strange that every time that you switch from one deck to the other, you do kind of have to switch your playing mind state because playing on a CDJ and playing on a turntable is a little bit different. They both work great, but it's definitely not the same device. It's not the same as using two turntables from different brands. They might have a little difference here and there, but it's still two turntables. But you could definitely play with a CD and a turntable. That would not be an issue either using real vinyl and real CDs or vinyl and a flash drive or control vinyl and a control CD with Serato or Tractor, it will all work. Um, I would just not know why you would want to do that. But if you feel that's your perfect setup, then go ahead and use that. All right, now this next question is interesting to me because I see similar questions all the time. Uh, I don't have the name anymore, but the question is, I recently got a DDJ SB2 and I've uh, gotten used to controlling it. I also have been watching your videos for advice and tutorials. However, I do not know what songs to use for mixing. I'm still a beginner. Could you recommend me some house, hip hop and instrumental songs to mix and learn beat matching with? Now it continues with some of the tracks he tried, but it was difficult to match them up and he wants advice. Now, I've received this question when it comes to beat matching, mixing, and also when it comes to scratching. People asking what records or what songs should I use for scratching. Guys, you can use anything. This tells me that you really haven't gotten the full grasp of what it means to actually DJ. Beat matching is a technique that works with any record. You're trying to match the tempo of two songs to make them play in sync so you can make a nice transition between the two. If you want to scratch, you can scratch with a kick drum, make that sound, or you find whatever type of sound. It could be a vocal, it could be an instrument, whatever. You can scratch with anything. Just find something that sounds nice. When it comes to scratching, you can also just go to my website. I'll link it down below, and I have some free scratch sounds for you and I also have a lot of free beats just instrumentals that you can use to practice with and do whatever you want but you can use anything so you can use any song so no I do not have recommendations for any genre because if you choose to play with a genre you're going to play all kinds of songs within that genre and one song is not better to practice than others now certain songs that have a totally different um, drum pattern compared to normal house music, for instance, might make it a little more tricky if you're just getting used to this. So for guys that have been in the game a little bit longer, if you use one of these Timbaland drum tracks where the kick and the snare are not just doing a normal boom, bap, boom, 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 bap or whatever, but they're going boom, ta, boom, ta, boom, ka, boom, boom, ka, that's going to catch people way off guard if they're not used to beat matching yet. But like in 95% of the cases, if you have your normal 4-4 time signature, any track will work. So just grab whatever you have, whatever you listen to, whatever is in your collection, and start to practice with that. Now, I have a lot of videos on beat matching, on learning how to count music, the most essential thing, learn how to count music, because that's going to help you with beat matching and scratching and everything. And learn to find that one. You can learn about timing, when would be the right time to do your mixes. I have videos on all that, but you can use any track. So again, I have free beats and sounds. You can check those out, but you can also use anything in your collection for practice purposes. There are no best songs to practice this and that, in my opinion. The next question is from DJ Polo from iRock DJs. And I was wondering how would you go about changing the norm $60 a gig for DJ payment in a weak DJ area. I'm a decent DJ that's done concerts with known artists and let me see, and used to earn 150 to 250 a night in the States and Korea. 
Now, this is something, and it's going to be different everywhere, but I was just having to talk about this today with some of my DJ colleagues and my real homies in this game. And I feel that in my own area here, it's all messed up right now too because there's too many DJs playing for way too low fees. And part of the reason for that is that the promoters are just like, hey, there's thousands of DJs that would want to play. This is what we offer. Do you want it or not? And they're playing for fees that are ridiculous in my eyes that are not even worth stepping out the house because you lose money the second you step out the house. Because once taxes are deducted and you deduct travel from that, you are left with nothing. So if you're a beginning DJ, I can understand. It might even be good to take low paid gigs if they can help you gain exposure. But I'm talking about a lot of DJs that already have the name and I still see their name pop up all over only to find out that they're doing it for ridiculously low fees. That messes up the entire game because you as one DJ will not be able to change that standard once it's in play. Because if most of those DJs adapt and accept it, you can make all the noise you want. I can make videos every week or talk to DJs every week and say it's ridiculous that we're being paid so little. And when I say we, it's them because I do not take those ridiculously low paid gigs. I don't know. That's not what I do. There are certain occasions where I see, okay, this could be a very good gig and I know their situation. They actually don't have a lot of money. We might be able to work something out. But in a lot of cases, it's just that the promoters already decided that they're not spending on DJs. So it's not that they don't have money. They decided they don't feel the need to spend it because they can get a ton of young DJs for nothing and they'll bring all their friends and that makes it all good. So it's going to be really hard if you have to do this on your own. I remember having conversations like this even 10 years ago with a lot of DJs. And we were even talking about that we should have a union, something that we're all connected to so we can have a, a, a set minimum price. And none of the DJs will go below that minimum price. Now, of course, that never happened. And even if you with a couple of DJs decide to do that, if you don't have enough DJs that support it and stick to that, it's never going to work. So it's really, really hard. So every DJ, you have to decide for yourself what is your minimum and are you just going to go with the flow? And if everyone's going to take 50, 60 dollar gigs in your area, you either join them or you just try to find the spots where you can get paid more because there are definitely still people that will pay more, but it might not be in the spots where you want to play. So it's a difficult situation. And I am going to make this the question of the day because I do feel it's an important topic. How do you in your local area, wherever you play, and maybe you play worldwide, how do you maintain a certain price? How do you keep that price there? Even if it might be in an area where a lot of DJs are taking these low to no fee gigs. Uh, might be a little vague question for some of you, and I know it's different all over the world. I realize that, but I think it's a cool topic to talk about, even though it probably will lead to nothing. Because like I said, you can change this on your own. And if you don't get like 90% of the DJs to go with you on this, you're not going to be able to change it. The only other thing you can do is organize your own thing. Find enough DJs to organize your own parties to try to set your own standard. And maybe you can pull the people away from those other parties. And at your parties, you're paying your DJs well and you're paying yourself well. But hey, like I said, I'd love to know your opinion on this. So join the conversation, share the knowledge in the comment section down below. Because share the knowledge, this is not just about me telling you guys how it is because I'm definitely not an expert at everything. I just have experience and I love sharing that. But I also love the fact that a lot of you guys come from different places. Things do not work the same everywhere. A lot of people have different ways to go about things. And that's why I also want you guys to share the knowledge by giving your input because I can learn from what you guys put in the comment section, but more importantly, I see a lot of you guys helping each other out and giving each other good ideas and that helps just 
you help bring value the same way I'm trying to bring value to this whole VJ scene. So shout out to you guys for all the comments because I see a lot of good things going on. And so same with this question. If you do have input, leave it in that comment section down below and let's help each other out. That's where I'm going to end it for today. I don't want to make these episodes too long. I might in the future just make them longer because I have plenty of questions to go on. If you want to ask a question, just go to Twitter and Instagram. Hit me up at the hashtag share the knowledge. Check me out on Snapchat. Just send me a text there if you have a question at that hashtag share the knowledge. Videos are cool, but the thing is those videos are gone after I watch them and that text allows me to just take that screenshot and save it in the phone, which is a lot easier for these episodes. Now, short questions work great. They save me some time. That's why Instagram and Twitter are best. But I understand that sometimes a question needs that backstory, so you will have to have a longer question. And you can do that through email. I understand. So don't be afraid. If you have that longer question, you can ask it there. I just might not be able to answer it in this show. And if it's good, I will try to answer it just by sending you an email back. Uh, that's it for now. If you enjoyed this info, make sure you like the video. If you're listening to the podcast on SoundCloud, make sure you like the audio, like the podcast. More importantly, though, guys, Share the video if you can. I'm also posting this on Facebook as a Facebook video. Also, try to share it there because that way we're really sharing the knowledge with more people. I know you guys are checking me out, but we want to make sure we expand this community so more people can check it out. So make sure you share the video, repost the, the podcast, and share this episode. That's it for now, guys. I'm going to see how my little guy is doing over there. He's playing Minecraft right now. I'm going to see what he's building. See you next time.